Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Kevin, for joining uh, Dr. Xi Gazing at Academia. Uh, today, we are going to talk to you specifically about your experiences of publishing during your PhD, as you have just finished your PhD thesis and you have published a lot. Um, so, first of all, can I invite you to briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for inviting me to your uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm Kevin Tai and I'm the Economic and Social Research Council Scholar and Doctoral Candidate in Applied Linguistics at the UCL Institute of Education, University College London. Uh, I recently submitted my PhD thesis for Viva examination. I'm also the editorial board member and editorial assistant of the language learning journal, which is managed by uh, Rao Lech. I completed my doctoral coursework in educational research at the University of Cambridge, where I was the Hughes Hall Hong Kong alumni scholar. Um, I did my master's degree uh, in applied linguistics and second language acquisition at, from the University of Oxford. My research interests uh, include language education policy, classroom discourse, translanguaging in multilingual context, and qualitative research methods, particularly multimodal conversation analysis, interpretive phenomenological analysis, and linguistic ethnography. Um, my research appeared in multiple uh, peer-reviewed journals, uh, particularly in uh, language and education, uh, system, apply linguistics, and uh, language teaching research. So that's me. Wow, that is a very impressive uh, profile, Kevin. So uh, can you share with us uh, three tips about publishing during your PhD? Sure. Um, so I think the first thing will be um, when you write your research paper, it's always important to have a strong argument for that. Um, so when you construct your argument of your paper, you have to think about, you know, why is it important for the reader to read your paper? Um, what can the reader learn from your paper? And how does the findings of your research provide implications to policy making and um, educational practices? The second thing will be uh, perhaps there, is, there, will be, there will be an opportunity where you can co-author your paper with your supervisor um, who is willing to support you. Um, and potentially they can ensure that the argument of your paper is strong enough um, to be submitted to job, top journals. The third advice that I would have would be uh, looking for the right journal for your paper. So, for example, for um, my professor is the editor of uh, International Journal of Bilingualism and Bilingual Education, and that journal has a specific focus on bilingual or multilingual education. So if your paper looks at English as a foreign language teaching or ESOL teaching, that is not the kind of work that they normally accept. So it's so it's important to ensure that the paper, the research topic that you're working on matches with the topic that the journal wants to publish. Um, the first thing is to look at your reference list and see what journals that you have been citing a lot. I mean, that would be a good indication in terms of which journal will be more likely to accept your research paper. And also uh, journal editors, when they look at your paper, they will be interested to know whether you have referenced the papers that are published in their journals as well. So the, I, I would suggest people to look at their reference list <laughs> to see which journal will be mo most likely to be a good option for you. That's a, yeah. that's a very good uh, advice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, what have been the main challenges uh, in publishing during your PhD and how have you tackled these challenges? Ooh, um, I think that I think the, the main challenge that I have will be will be um, you know the moment when you have to deal with the peer reviewers mean and ruthless comments um, because it can be really discouraging. And I sometimes question myself uh, in terms of, you know, why do I have to go through such a process? 
you know, I think last year I actually thought about would it be easier if I work as a school teacher uh, rather than becoming an academic? Because, you know, working as a school teacher, you don't really have to, you know, do research or write research papers. You just do your teaching and you do all this routine work, administrative work. You know, so what's the point of going through all these difficult moments? But I, you know, I gradually feel that, you know, the more I read uh, in terms of the mean comments, the more it really prepares me uh, to deal with these comments calmly and professionally. I think it's similar to what you said in your previous videos, where it's important for us to build up um, the rejection muscles, uh, how we can deal with them professionally. Um, so in terms of responding to these harsh or negative peer reviewers comments, I think we should deal with them as if we would deal with other comments and, you know, give a point by point response to the comments and mentioning, you know, whether you agree or disagree with them. Um, if you disagree with some of the comments, um, you have to make sure that you're providing convincing, re you're providing, you know, good reasons for doing so. Um, but I, I totally understand it can be, you know, really disturbing to receive such comments. And there are moments where you can't even defend yourself because it will be directly rejected by the editors. Um, so the second thing that I would say is to, uh, if your paper is being rejected, um, consider the comments carefully and see whether you can edit the paper based on the peer, review peer reviewers uh, feedback and then submit it to another journal. It's the matter of keep trying really. And um, I also think that um, it's important, as a PhD student, I think it's important to do pilot study uh, so that you can at least publish a few papers based on your pilot study uh, findings. Um, because I, it was very useful for me because last year during the COVID-19, um, I have to suspend my PhD data collection for five months because I do classroom ethnography. I couldn't go into classrooms. So um, the fact that I did a pilot study for two weeks, I collect some amount of data. And, I, and during that suspension, I have time to think about what kind of themes or arguments that I can make for my PhD thesis. And I try to write the papers with my supervisor. Um, so my supervisor's role is really just to ensure that my argument is strong enough for the paper. And I will do all the rest of the work. And um, it's important to constantly think about the arguments of your paper and how you can ensure that um, you are providing a convincing or meaningful message. Uh, to the readers of your target journals. Mm. So, so you have that quite, quite mm -hmm. uh, strategic, you know, in terms yes. of planning your time, planning the sort of uh, tasks that you carry out during your PhD, mm. right? So yeah, and, and this is a link to my next uh, question, which is mm -hmm. about what advice would, would you give to beginning PhD students in thinking about planning for publications? Mm. I think for first year PhD students, it would be ideal for them to think about publication early because it is uh, very time consuming. And if you want to be an academic in the future, it's important to have a strong publication records um, because um, it's getting more competitive to get a job um, in the field of, in academia really. And a lot of universities are looking for, um, you know, higher numbers of publications per researcher. And um, universities in Asia in particular, so, uh, you know, focuses a lot more on impact factor of the journal. So it's not like you can just publish in whatever journals you want. It's all about like the reputation of the journal. But I think the situation in the UK is slightly more relaxed. So you can submit to journals like Language Learning Journal, which is the journal that I'm part of. That journal is not um, SSCI indexed. So it's not 
index in social science web of science thing. <laughs> what is it called? Social science citation index. Yeah, it's not in that uh, ranking list. But in the UK, that you are fine. Like you don't have to go for SSCI. But in Asia, it's it's a big thing. So think about whether you want to submit to your paper to a top journal, and um, whether you want to as you know establish your reputation as a scholar. My second advice will be like considering turning your undergraduate thesis or master thesis findings into several research papers, because that's what I did. Um, I published one paper from my under honors thesis and also two papers from my master's thesis. Um, and I make sure, and I did ensure that each one of the papers have its own argument. Um, don't, don't waste your don't waste your data collection. Uh, don't waste your data. Um, use them wisely and see whether you can get something out there. That, so that's pretty much it. Wow, that is really good advice. Thank you. So, but can you? how you sort of use your time during your PhD to do so many things, for instance, to turn your undergraduate dissertation and your master's dissertation into uh, peer-reviewed journal uh, publication. Mm. What about how did you like arrange your, your, your time, right? Because we know that as mm. a PhD student, you have a lot of tasks, uh, uh, you know, for instance, uh, working very hard on your PhD thesis itself mm. can in itself be a very daunting task already. Mm. So how did you arrange, you know, how did you do your time management so well? Mm. <laughs> I, uh, I feel like that is, um, that that's why uh, people keep saying to me that I don't have a life because <laughs> I focus a lot in my academic work. Um, I suppose like during your first year of a PhD, uh, you know, you focus a lot more on your on developing the research questions for your PhD thesis and also read a lot around your research area. So you are supposed to develop a literature review chapter and methodology chapters during your first year of your PhD. And it's all about doing a lot of readings. Um, so I think during the first year of your PhD, it will be a good time to think about turning your master's thesis into research papers. Um, the reason why I turned my undergraduate thesis into a paper is because I was worried about funding for my PhD a degree because if when you apply for a PhD, it's getting more and more competitive to get funding. So if you have publications beforehand, it will be quite handy. Like it will be easier to attract the scholarship board's attention. Um, but in terms of how I manage my time, I suppose it's because like during your first year of your PhD is all about doing all the readings. So you should be able to squeeze some time uh, in terms of uh, to to focus up some to focus on your publication records. Really, I mean, you, you should be able to squeeze some time. I don't know how I don't I don't know how I did it. I just did it because <laughs> uh, um, if you are determined enough, you will be able to make time for turning your thesis into a publication. And it's not really a daunting process because. It's not like you have to rewrite your paper. It's all about you, you know, you know, you just reuse some bits from your thesis and you put it into a paper. So it's not really a daunting task where you 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 have to rephrase everything. No, like no, that's not that's not the case. So you can actually mm -hmm. extract a lot of stuff from your thesis and you know and submit it to journals. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good to do do that during your first year. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So, is there anything else that you would like to share with us today? Oh yes. Uh, so, I think other than publications, it's it is always important for PhD students to acquire some teaching experience because uh, most of the permanent academic positions you know, involve both teaching and research. So it's useful to build up some teaching experience during your PhD and um, potentially explore whether your university provides like uh, higher education teaching programs for, for early career researchers. And potentially you can also do the um, Associate Fellow of Higher Education Academy 
scope um, scheme where you can get the qualification as the AFHEA, I think it's very, it will be quite good if you can get that. So I recently submitted my application for that fellowship as well. Um, my second advice for all PhD students is to really try to build up a supportive network where you can um, share your thoughts with your colleagues. Um, and also because um, this supporting network is important because it, it, it is a way where you can talk to your, to, you know, talk to people that you can trust. Uh, you can talk to your supervisor because like they know you and they know your research project and they know, you, you know, what kind of opportunities out there that are suitable for you. And also talk to other PhD students uh, because, you know, they know exactly what you're going through and you'll be able, they will be able to offer you, you know, different insights into the PhD. You know, my best, best friends around me, they are all PhD students and I, I'm very grateful that they are, they are supporting me throughout this dog crew journey because without them, I don't know how am I going to survive. Because doing a PhD, it's stressful in many ways. So um, it's very different from working in an office environment because um, the only person who really understands your research project will be your supervisor. So you have to make sure that you are having a good relationship with him or her over three to four years. And I have heard lots of sad stories where students don't really have a good relationship with PhD supervisors and their life uh, during their PhD journey. It uh, wasn't, that wasn't that great. Um, so having a good relationship with your PhD supervisor and, the supervi and having a supervisor who can also support you intellectually, it's equally important. So my third advice will be like, don't just look at the ranking of the university when you apply for PhD. Also make sure that your supervisor has the relevant expertise to supervise you because, um, because that's what I have gone through. I moved from Cambridge to University College London. And, um, you know, I eventually understand the importance of having a principal supervisor who can support me intellectually and, and really develop me as a future scholar. So, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much, Kevin. This is absolutely important. I, 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 well, I want to echo you in terms of, you know, having a very supportive network. And, mm. and it's really a good point in uh, emphasizing that uh, building uh, your, your supportive network, especially with other PhD students, is very, very mm. beneficial. It can be mutually beneficial. Like while mm. other people support you, other PhD students support you, you can also support them, right? Mm. And that is, uh, that is actually uh, nurturing, not only during the PhD stage, but, you know, now that I have got a few years post PhD, I, I actually still uh, uh, maintain uh, like uh, contact with my uh, mm. colleagues because uh, we sort of see each other uh, as peers and then you know mm. our academic journeys we, we sort of keep uh, supporting each other you know and mm. we grow together and I think that is mm. an incredibly uh, important sort of resource to, to have. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, and uh, I, I wish you all the best in your, uh, you know, uh, job searching uh, experience. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.